Our homes today are full of stuff that we hold on to because of the supposed value they maintain. This waste will no longer be needed. In this economic model, the city, or in fact the entire world, is really your home. If you require an automobile for whatever reason, the car is made available for you. When you get to your destination, the satellite-based driving system will automatically make the car available for others to use, as opposed to sitting in some parking lot, wasting space and time. In society today, the need for property results in extreme product overlap and redundant waste. It is much more intelligent to create a universal shared system, for it dramatically reduces waste, redundancy, and increases space and efficiency. Human Behavior In this section, we are going to discuss the issue of human behavior and its relationship to the environment, while also addressing the legal system and its extremely despotic, backwards basis for influencing human conduct. Some people who consider the tenets of a resource-based economy tend to think that the system would be difficult due to something called human nature. The argument is that humans are inherently competitive, greedy, and blindly self-serving, implying that no matter how technically good things are in society, there will always be corrupt people who want to abuse others and seek dominance. Human nature is defined as the shared psychological attributes of humankind that are assumed to be shared by all human beings. Therefore, the implication of the term is that certain psychological, hence mental behaviors, are in some way hardwired into a person. We are thus supposedly born with some preset psychological inclinations. It is easy to see how this kind of assumption has manifest. For if you look at the historical record for the human species thus far, we see an endless series of wars, genocides, conquests, and power abuses. Given that this is the pattern we recognize, it is easy to assume that it must be some set human nature to behave in ways that are historically reoccurring. Furthermore, so-called criminal behavior has been a focus of psychologists for some time. Is it the responsibility of an individual's genetic makeup that makes them a so-called criminal? Or is it the environment in which they are raised that determines this? This is the age-old question of nature versus nurture. First, what exactly is criminal behavior? How do we qualify behavioral distinctions that have been invented by man and change with time? The entire concept of criminality is temporal and relative to a culture's values and concepts of morality. Only 600 years ago, certain indigenous cultures around Mexico engaged in mass human sacrifice, often killing thousands at a time. Was this criminal activity? To us, perhaps, but to them it was accepted social custom. What about the generations and generations of accepted slavery? Is a criminal someone who steals food in order to feed his or her starving family? The bottom line is that there is no concrete scientific evidence that really supports the notion that any of our behaviors are strictly the result of our genetics. The notion of human nature is largely mythological. It stems from primitive religious dualities that the human is good or evil inherently. The pursuit of people who seek the gene or the like, which is supposedly the cause of a particular behavior, is essentially a form of superstition. It is like a person being possessed by demons, which control their actions. The fact is, while neurochemicals and physiological traits set propensities for a person's reactions and social gravitation, it is the environment that really creates our values and behavior. There is no fixed, predetermined human nature. Our values, methods, and actions are developed and derived from experiences. A Chinese baby taken at birth and raised in a British family in England will develop the language, dialect, mannerisms, traditions, and accent of the British culture. The bottom line is that our behavior is based upon what we learn, coupled with the biosocial pressures that we must deal with in order to survive. As far as society today, the most fundamental condition for offensive behavior is derived from the monetary system. As expressed before, the monetary system perpetuates corruption, stratification, scarcity, and insufficiency. So-called decency cannot exist in a world of competition, wealth imbalance, poverty, and deprivation. The despotic behavior we see in the world today is not the result of ingrained genetic forces. It is essentially a result of years of scarcity and competition. The Legal System in response to this, society today attempts to control people by way of threat, using laws. Laws are nothing more than patches which do not address the root causes of behavior. If a person is arrested for stealing, very little thought is given as to why that person chose to steal to begin with. 
Rather than consider the root causes, society today takes the easy way out and often removes the so-called criminal via prisons. The source of any so-called crime is really society itself. There is no such thing as a criminal. As repeatedly expressed, the monetary system generates corruption by its very construct. As the Merva and Fowl study presented previously clearly shows, socially offensive behavior is directly related to the socio-economic circumstances. The great majority of people in prisons come from deprived socio-economic positions. Therefore, if we want to alter the behavior of people, we have to alter the social conditions. We want to design out the flaws. You don't put up a sign that says speed limit 55 miles per hour for safety. You design the system technically so safety is built in and human error is either greatly reduced or not an option. If you don't want a person to steal, you make what they need readily available to them without the need for debt, subservience, or competition. With the progress of technology today, we have the ability to create a new social system that can allow all people access to the necessities of life without a price tag, debt, or servitude. This will have a profound effect on the way people treat each other and interact in society. A staggering drop in crime would be the result, for most crimes are monetary related. Furthermore, for those crimes that might occur, such as a person who kills another out of jealousy, they would not be treated as a criminal, but rather as a sick patient. Society will understand that people are products of their environment, and rather than condemn the person to a cold, concrete cell, social scientists, psychologists, and sociologists will heavily research the cultural causes that generated the killer's behavior and consider those conditions that need to be altered, often through education. In conclusion, since antiquity, great religious and secular philosophers alike have constantly advocated peaceful, unified ideals for humanity. From Christianity to Hinduism, the idea of seeing others as yourself is a long-standing disposition. Sadly, one glance at society today makes one wonder why the idea of universally valuing and respecting your fellow human being and working together has never taken root. Today's self-interest, money-oriented society creates an environment that refuses to allow for the universal caring and account of another. This system is based on the perpetuation of oneself, at the expense of others, and therefore it will never allow for a world of balance and harmony. The fact is, it is time to stop praying, stop wishing, and stop blindly talking about our supposed humanistic and religious ideals and actually work to make them happen. A resource-based economy puts into practice everything the great religious and philosophic teachers have always talked about in regard to humans embracing each other as their own and working together in mutual respect as a single human family. The use of science and the scientific method, while often deemed cold and heartless, actually presents one of the most profound spiritual unfoldings we have ever seen. While many people look with great awe and respect upon figures like Mother Teresa and her selfless nature, few tend to see Alexander Fleming, the man who discovered penicillin, in the same romanticized way. Penicillin has saved countless more lives today than any charitable idea or organization. The point is, is that science and technology are divinity in action. We cannot wait for some divine revelation or some great man to guide us. We must realize that we are on our own on this planet, and it is up to us to change the world for the better. It is time we stop pontificating and providing lip service to those spiritual values which religious and secular philosophers have been discussing for millennia and finally put them into practice. Science is the tool for this functional spirituality, and if we work to apply its methods for the betterment of civilization itself, we can reach the spiritual goals we have sought since antiquity. <laughs>